What's going on everyone and welcome back to another episode of the world's spottiest grown man talks about fantasy football on an infrequent basis. That's right, it's been a few game weeks since I did one of these videos and there's a couple of reasons for that. Well, there's one reason for that, really. You could, and I'm saying could, argue that because I did so badly, I didn't want to make videos and I was hiding away from the fact that I was doing badly after having a fairly good start to the season. <laughs> but I don't know why you would say that. Um, but the other reason is that I was feeling under the weather and I know, I think I've actually used this excuse in the past. I wasn't lying, it's true. But I do have some proof for you. I did try and record a video a couple of weeks back. Take a look for yourself. As you can probably tell from the sound of my voice, I haven't been feeling too well, but don't worry about it. It's nothing too serious. All that happened was, I, um, I had sex um, with a man. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is my progress over the last two or three weeks, my upcoming plans. Going to look at some more overrated and underrated players, some that are perhaps under the radar, some that are way too much on people's radars, in my opinion at least. We're going to talk about captains, clean sheets, stuff that every other podcast or video or everything else talks about as well. But first, I think there's only one place we can start, and I can't believe more people aren't talking about this. I think it's a massive, massive issue. We need to be talking about this as a potential rule change. People talk about bonus points being a bit iffy. People talk about some other rules being introduced or defensive midfielders being rewarded. I completely disagree with that, but how about this for a rule? You should get minus two points if you leave the pitch to have a shit, Jamie Vardy. I mean, leaving the pitch with no permission to just go to the toilet. That is an absolute disgrace. Anyway, let's move on to the real stuff right now. So I pulled up my score on screen this week, uh, game week nine. I managed to get 50 points. I took my very first points hit of the season. I did three moves. I had two free transfers. I took a minus four. As I say, the first points hit of the season and oh my fucking God, it might be the worst points hit I've ever taken in my life. I decided to do the triple move. I did Trippier out because Ericsson was back. I was a little unsure about the free kick situation, corner situation there. I imagine Ericsson would take over some of the duties, if not the majority of them. I was also concerned with Vertonghen being out injured. I didn't really like Spurs defence. Obviously Trippier did go on to keep a clean sheet, so... That screwed me over a little bit. I bought in Trent Alexander-Arnold, who is a rotation risk. And I generally stay away from rotation risk. And this is why, because he got benched again, didn't play. Zero pointer. It actually worked out quite luckily for me because I got Duffy in for the seven pointer. But, you know, I would have had Trippier anyway for a six pointer, I think, if I hadn't have done that move. I also did Mane out, who wasn't going to play from his injury. I bought in Sterling, who again didn't play. Because he didn't play, I managed to get one Besaka's one pointer in off the bench. That was very, very good. The other move I did so that I could afford that was Arnautovic out, who again, I was very worried about his fitness. I've been watching him recently and whilst he's been getting in some good positions, that knee of his, it's just infuriating to watch him because he's just not as mobile as he was before and it's really annoying to watch him. And in order to be able to afford those moves, as I say, I had to bring in someone cheaper. So I made the move to Danny Ings for a massive two points. So you could say that I spent four points on Danny Ings and You'd be right in saying that. The week before that was one of my worst ever game week ranks over 4.5 million. I got 37 points. It's the only week of the season so far where I've been below the average. It just didn't go well for me. I had the Doherty 15 pointer as first sub. And you may well have noticed that I still don't have Eden Hazard. The reason I bought in Sterling this week is because it gives me a bit of flexibility regarding Hazard. I didn't want to bring him in. You know, I've been avoiding him all this time. Not intentionally avoiding him. I just haven't been able to work him into my team yet. And I guess my overall rank is around 60k. So it's kind of proof that you haven't needed Hazard to do okay so far. I'm not flying anymore, but hopefully I can start to improve the position. But if I wasn't, if I couldn't fit Hazard in uh, before that time, I certainly wasn't going to be fitting him in for a game against Man United when Manchester City had Burnley in a game that they won 5-0. I'm going to have to make a decision on that Sterling situation now because Hazard plays against Burnley and Sterling plays against Spurs but then after that Spurs match they do have a good run but obviously he's a rotation risk everything that comes with that so things are in a little bit of doubt but Hazard could be injured it looks like he's got a knock to his back could just be the classic excuse of getting him out of the Europa League match we will have to see on that one will he return in the league it's going to be a last minute decision for me but I am looking to hold the transfer this week my team looks fairly good going into game week 10 
This is how I'm planning on lining up at the moment with Hart in goal, Alexander Arnold if he plays, against Cardiff, Doherty against Brighton, Alonso against Burnley, Fraser, Salah as captain, and then we've got the triple Man City attack that have a difficult fixture. That's the only real concern for me, with Mitrovic at home against Bournemouth and Ings at home against Newcastle. If I have any issues, Duffy at home against Wolves, not the worst fixture in the world for the first sub, and a fairly goal threatening. that's not a word, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Defender as the first sub. Let's move on now to talking about some of the players that I perhaps think are too highly tipped. This is something I did before in the video where I did five unpopular FPL opinions. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more now. There's a couple of players in there that I already spoke about then. And I'm going to talk about some players that I think are worth a look. Players that I'm going to start with are ones that I think are too highly talked about at the moment. First one, someone that I've talked about before, Madison. Looks great. Looks really, really class act on the pitch, but it just isn't transforming into FPL points. Well, actually, it kind of is, but only luckily, I've beaten the drum on this one before. I think he's not the best FPL pick in the world, especially at his ever-increasing price. I could be eating my words on this one, but I just don't see it. He's just a really good player, but not a great FPL pick. I don't think Claude Puel managed sides are good FPL picks when they are attackers at least. And that leads me on to the next player, Jamie Vardy. A lot of people are looking at Vardy as an option. Shout out Ashley, my main mini league rival, who will be watching this and I know is looking at Jamie Vardy very closely. I don't think he suits Puel's system. Puel doesn't like to play the ball in behind, doesn't like to play the ball on the counter. They're a very slow moving um, possession, so possession side. They're not really possession uh, in sort of the way that Man City are or, you know, the good possession-based sides that we've seen in the past, but they, they just like to play things simple and not too many risks. And we've even seen Jamie Vardy's wife, if you're into celebrity gossip like I am, on Twitter liking tweets that have criticised Claude Puel's style of play in regards to how this affects Jamie Vardy. Of course, we have also seen that Jamie Vardy does like to leave the pitch around the 85th minute or so to go for a poo. So that could play on your mind if you're a manager as well. The next option is Richarlison. Now, this is a really exciting one uh, sort of because I spoke about this one in the unpopular opinions one where I said that I actually thought Walcott would outscore Richarlison this year a lot of people called me crazy for that and I do think I will change my mind on that now especially because Richarlison is playing up front however to me he doesn't look as good up front he looks better in midfield where he's cutting in from that wing getting shots away being selfish whereas Everton their problem at the moment seems to be that they're not creating enough chances for their strikers. So to move one of your most creative assets from the midfield and stick him up front, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me, but you know, I'm not a Premier League manager. For me, I would rather have him in my team as a midfielder than him playing up front. And this is just a weird situation because normally everyone would be creaming their pants over uh, a midfielder that's playing up front for their side. But for me, it just doesn't seem to be clicking for Richarlison, but maybe with a bit of practice and a bit of improvement, that could change. Arsenal attackers. This is something that a lot of people are looking at. Lacazette, Aubameyang, who should you go for out of those? There's Ozil, who's just bagged some goals. I'm not sold on them. I'm not sold on Arsenal's attack. They beat Fulham 5-1 a couple of game weeks ago, and the expected goals in that match was one goal apiece. So according to the data, they shouldn't really have scored that many goals. Their game against Leicester was sort of a fair representation. But for me, I, I just don't know. The player that I would definitely have if he could nail down a place is Aubameyang. But with him starting on the bench, you can't guarantee that he's going to get subbed on and score two goals every game, even though he's done it two games in a row, because that's just a ridiculous assumption. If his minutes are cut, then you're looking at a very, very expensive player for someone that's going to play only 20 minutes, half an hour a game. Lacazette, for me, could be an option, but I'm preferring the premium midfielders over Lacazette at this moment in time. Ozil is just Ozil. He's not selfish enough for me. The final one that I'm going to look at in terms of perhaps overrated players is Chelsea's defence. Chelsea, despite the fact that they've kept a relatively good defending record, kept a few clean sheets, not conceded that many goals. Expected goals against is quite high. They have actually conceded a lot of clear cut chances, far more than Manchester City, far more than Liverpool, despite the fact that they've only conceded a similar amount of goals. To me, this implies that it's short term luck that is on their side. And over the long term, we can probably expect them to start conceding more goals unless they start to shore things up at the back. Now for me, someone with Alonso in my team, this makes things a little bit tricky because I do love Alonso. He, he will probably probably stay in my team for his attacking exploits but the fact that I can't rely on him to keep clean sheets is a little bit of a concern and it should be to you if you hold one or more Chelsea defenders. Who's perhaps underrated at this moment in time? Um, well 
I'm not going to say that these are amazing wild shouts and they're not underrated by most people, but I've just looked at the people with the highest XG plus XA stats. That's expected goals plus expected assists per 90 minutes. And I've excluded people that have played less than 300 minutes. These stats are taken from understat. Very good website if you're interested in looking at this sort of data. The player that tops the XG plus XA stats per 90 minutes based on those minutes is Sergio Aguero. He's the only player averaging more than one expected involvement in every match. Now, this is expected goals and assists outside the world of FPL. So in FPL, you do get more assists. So I would imagine that some people are going to be getting more FPL assists than real assists. So that, that is a factor. But according to this data, Aguero is the only player with more than one expected goal involvement per 90 minutes. The next player on that list is Mo Salah. He's, the, he's just below the one mark. And it doesn't surprise me as a Salah owner, someone that's kept the faith in him, that he is the second highest on there. A lot of people who ditched Salah, perhaps not looking at the underlying stats and seeing that, you know what, he's not playing too badly. It is what it is. I'm keeping him in my side for the foreseeable future, that's for sure. The next highest after Salah is Eden ha No. It's not Hazard, it's Sané. Doesn't play enough minutes for me, so you wouldn't perhaps look at him in your side. But then after Sané, it's Eden Callum Wilson. Then it's Eden Hazard. So for someone who's 11 million-ish and getting all the rave reviews, he's not that good, Hazard, at this moment in time. Yes, he is good, but he's not the elite level stats person that's you know far outperforming the other players in terms of underlying stats you can still do well without him in your side i'm sort of proof of that but you know i do need to improve my rank and i am looking to bring him in but he's not doing as well as some people make out after hazard you've then got mares Giroud, and raheem sterling a lot of rotation risks in there a lot of man city assets as i say that's taken from understat if you do want to go and dig into the data a little bit more we've got a lot of good clean sheet options this week brighton and wolves that could be a drab game bournemouth against fulham i i see some goals to be honest liverpool expecting a clean sheet for them against cardiff southampton against newcastle another one that could easily be a bore draw watford against huddersfield don't expect both of those teams to score leicester against west ham who knows which way that could go, but as I've already said, I don't really like Claude Puel managed attacking sides. Burnley against Chelsea. Burnley, not really the same side this year that they have been in the last year or two. Could see a Chelsea clean sheet there. Crystal Palace and Arsenal. I can't see a clean sheet for either of those teams. Man United against Everton. Tough one to call. I could see Man United keeping a clean sheet in that. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if Everton did either. And Spurs against Man City. I think everyone would agree that we probably expect goals there. Uh, but there's a lot of potential clean sheets, so cue the goals, cue goals in every single game and just shutting me up on what I've just said there. But I think you can be fairly confident playing a wide variety of defenders this week and, you know, it's not too much of a headache. As for potential captain picks, I've got Mo Salah. If you've got Mo Salah, you should be pretty happy with him. Then outside of that, things get a little bit trickier with Spurs playing Man City. You know, if you've got Aguero, if you've got Kane, if you've got other assets from those sides, you've got a little bit of a headache. Arsenal away at Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace aren't a bad side. Roy Hodgson's got them playing some pretty solid defensive football. They've been a little unlucky with some recent results. And outside of that, you've also got the rotation risk of Arsenal assets. Chelsea away against Burnley. It's tricky. It's always tricky to captain an away player. A lot of people don't like captaining players that are away from home. So for me, the captains are tough this week if you don't have Mo Salah. So hopefully for me, he can deliver the goods. If you don't have him, then I would probably be looking towards Hazard. I would be avoiding Man City assets at this time. I think I've pretty much covered everything there. One more thing before I go, if you haven't ever checked out Beating Betting, that's beatingbetting.co.uk, just check it out. Just spare two or three minutes, go to my website. It's something that I set up, I've ran pretty much single-handedly the whole time. Especially if you're in the UK, it's more than worth just taking those few minutes to check it out because it could be an opportunity for you and I teach everyone for free. If you found this useful, hit that like button down below. Let me know any thoughts or questions you have in the comments section. And if you do want to see more fantasy football or betting related videos, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and I'll see you again in another video. Thank you very much for watching.